Welcome to another episode of Field Phone Ops. Today we're going to talk about control groups, the AN Gray 6 and the AN Gray 39. So sit back and uh, I hope you learned something. And here we go. We're going to compare the AN GRA 6 Gray 6 with the AN GRA 39. Basically after World War II, uh, they had to come up with a better system. They had a system called an RC-261, which was uh, rather primitive. It allowed them to remote a radio about a half mile using two devices, but you had to have an actual headset to wear, an actual hand mic to talk into. Uh, didn't have the ability to actually call back and forth between the units and coordinate activities or anything. And you were stuck with using the, like I said, a uh, hand microphone or a uh, head headset that actually plugged in using the, the phono jacks. Uh, so basically, about the time Korea will start kicking off, they decided we need to come up with something better. This is what they came up with. They came up with the, uh, the ANGR GRA 6. This is it. This is the remote unit right here. Local unit on top. Basically, you connect the field wire here and here. Could run about two miles remote to radio. You use one of these U77 connectors, which was the big connect at the time for all the radios and such. And they used a H39 handset, like this right here, that plugged in. Connected a handset here and a handset here. This was in your command post, your talk, or the area where you want to remote from. And this was actually at the radio itself. And it's connected, they're connected onto the radio. Some of these units, I don't have one, actually had the ability to connect to two radios. It actually gave the operator here the ability to switch right here between set one or set two, depending on which radio you wanted to use. One of the problems with this setup right here was once you had this all hooked up, you couldn't listen to what was going on in radio traffic without holding the handset to your head the whole time. So they came up with this as the splitter. Allowed you to basically connect that uh, speaker in place along the handset so you could hear what was going on. And this is the actual loudspeaker they used right here. It had this connector. So you connect the speaker on one side, handset on the other, you could hear what was going on. This used the uh, two D-cell batteries in each unit to do the audio part. Basically, they function as field phones. You connect these up to a TA-312 or an EE-8 or any other field phone. You can actually make phone calls to them. You have the hand crank right here on each one. They can send a ring. They can receive a ring. They have little indicators so you know it's ringing. So it's a cheap alternative to a field phone. This unit, the local, or the remote unit right here, actually had a 45-volt battery in it. And that's how it keyed the radio at the other end. They say when you, they would set it to radio, the radio function switch right there, and key the handset, it would then trigger a relay in here with a 45 volts, which would key the radio, then they could talk and everything would go and they'd release it, everything would go back to normal. The, uh, the local unit actually had connections right here. This is the, uh, what it was going to operate as. You either operate as a telephone, if you're talking on a telephone, an actual uh, carrier wave or FSK, uh, believe it or not, at the time that these came out, uh, Morse code and uh, telegraph was still a viable option for military communications at the time. So that's what the selector was for. And then you had just normal AM right there. That was normal AM operations on the radio. Then right here you could operate the radio in either local mode, which means whoever was plugged in right here was using the radio. Telephone mode, which was the person plugged in here was talking as the telephone on the other end, or remote mode. In remote mode, the actual remote control set right here actually was keying and listening to the radio. This worked good. The only problem with this because it used DC keying, it couldn't go through a uh, field switchboard, a uh, BD 71 or 72 or an SB 22 at the later date or SB 86. The DC uh, voltage that was on that 45 volts was filtered out by some of the filtering and coil equipment loading coils inside the telephone equipment, so that was the only issue. But you could go two miles. So about the early 60s, they started working on a replacement for the the gray 6 and came up with the ANGRA 39, also called the Angry 39 by the Army troops and stuff. Uh, this was in use from the, the early 60s into the 2000s. We still use these when I was in the, the Air National Guard big time. Um, basically, one of the main differences was, I don't know if you can see, uh, the, the size difference between the local and remote here were, was rather significant. These are basically about the same size. They are physically, dimension-wise, are the same. Uh, the remote end weighs, I think, a half pound more than the, the local end weighs. 
Uh, the other big change was they went to using U229 and H250 hand pins. You can see the difference between the old connector right here and the new connector. They also added a speaker to the remote unit. So you can actually set this up right here on the controls. You can set it to, let's see, a radio and turn the speaker on right there. This controls the actual volume of the speaker. So basically you could hear in the speaker what was going on in the radio. You'd have to hold the hands up to your head the whole time. Then when you wanted to talk on it, you could leave it sitting there like that or you could put it right there in the telephone mode which would let you talk, actually talk in the telephone to the other end. And there was the uh, handset mode for the radio. I'm sorry, I got sort of confused here. Field wire connected right here in these binding posts. This is the actual way you called the other end. You'd actually pump that a few times and it would cause this end to ring. It had a little indicator light on it so you could see the ring was coming on. It was adjustable for dimness. Uh, had a volume adjuster on the ringer right here. This little thing right here turned around back and forth. So this is a pretty handy device. Having the speaker on it, it was a lot better than having to have all the uh, splitters and external speakers and stuff that the old AN GRC GRA 6 used. Both of these used uh, six D-cell batteries, so no more having to go find the crazy 45 volt battery like this system used. Another thing was they got away from using the DC King, they actually used a toned key in. When you keyed, had this set for radio, and this set for, uh, set in uh, radio, okay, remote radio, and the operator right here keyed their handset, they actually would generate a 3900 hertz tone, which would go over the field wire, and that's what this would see when it saw the tone, it would key the radio. So basically it would then filter that tone out. So that's how it worked. By doing this, it allowed it to be operated through a switchboard. So in the uh, 60s and 70s when the Army was working on their, uh, their radio wireline interfacing and pushing that real heavy for all the, uh, their communications in the field, you could actually hook this up to a SB22 and actually somebody could call using a TA312 access into this and talk on a radio. So that was pretty remarkable. And that's how it worked. Um, like I said, uh, basically they're basically used at the same time. This was from the 1950s and the early 1980s, and this from the 1960s into the the, the 2000s. Pretty remarkable pieces of equipment. Um, not really field phones, but they're very uh, they use field wire, and they're part of the actual the wired communication system that they use in the field. I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.